Thank you, Bill. Give me just a minute to get adjusted here. So half of the church is on vacation, the pastor's on vacation, and that means you're stuck with me. Um, I didn't pick that passage because I thought it was somber. Uh, it's just kind of something God's been working with me on, and um, I wanted to be uh, a little bit more personal with you guys than I have been in the past. So uh, before we get going, though, let's pray and hope that God blesses the work. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the parable that you've given us to look at today. Uh, I pray that you would uh, be with me and help me to explain as clearly as possible, as closely as possible, what you meant when you told this story. And I pray that you would be, be with the folks here listening, that you would touch their hearts and open their minds, open their hearts, to what you have to say for them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, being somebody who grew up in the church, I've, I've heard this parable taught from a number of times. And very often, at the end of the parable, at the end of the sermon, the pastor asks for your money. Um, so I have good news and bad news. One, I'm not going to do that today. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is the reason that I'm not going to do that today is I don't think that goes far enough. Um, the, the parable, the story that is meant here for an illustration is just one layer. And in that parable, money is the, the illustration. So money is a, a, is a piece of it, but it's not the point of it. The point of it is something a little bit deeper. Any, any parable that you read in the Bible is using something that is touchable, tangible, measurable, and easily understandable to teach about something underneath that is more abstract, a little bit more amorphous, and more of a principle than a thing. So money's not the point. I'm not going to ask you for money today, even though I do believe that we all should be contributing a portion of our income to the church, um, because that is what supports the work of the church. But the reason I'm not going to ask you for money is I don't think that that's enough. I think that there is more that is expected of God's servants. So, to start understanding this story correctly, understanding this metaphor, the word talent. Normally, in the English language, when we hear the word talent, we think of some innate skill that somebody has that they possess, and it's something that they're very good at, sort of on their own. But in Greek and in this original story, the word wasn't used for an innate skill. It, was, it, it meant a certain weight of silver, or in kind of the idea that it was conveying, it was kind of, one talent is more or less enough to retire on. Uh, in the Old Testament times, it specifically meant about 75 pounds of silver. So whatever silver is going for today, you can imagine 75 pounds is worth quite a bit of money. But in the New Testament time, it had kind of morphed a little bit, and it was understood more to be about 15 to 20 years of whatever your wage was. So it's enough to retire on. One talent is enough to retire on. And in our story, the master has enough talents, enough of his own individual nest eggs, that he can not only afford to go on this extended trip, whether it's a business trip or a vacation, but he can afford to leave a large portion of his money behind and in the hand of his servants to manage his household. So that's a lot of money. But again, money is the, the top layer, if you will, of the parable. It's, it's, it's the illustration, it's not the point. Underneath that, what I think the talent is meant to represent is sort of actually like what we normally think of as a talent, a natural skill. But a little bit more than that. I think it's a God-given skill, and it's a God-given skill to Christians. If you're a Christian, if you are one of God's servants, then you have talent in this respect. Some people call them spiritual gifts, and I'll get into that a little bit more here in a little while. But it's not just the issue that you have that skill, that you have that innate ability. You have enough of that innate ability to do whatever God has called you to do. One talent was enough to retire on. 
And here this, this wealthy man leaves a lot of money, more than one talent, in the hands of his servants. Each of them then had at least enough to retire on for themselves. They probably didn't make as much as their master did. But getting down to that, that lower layer, they had enough skill, they had enough talent, they had enough of a spiritual gift to be sufficient to whatever task God called them to do. And they were responsible to be faithful with that skill and to be faithful to that call. The story goes on and the master returns and you, you see the first two servants go to the master, the one who had received the two talents and the one who had received the five talents. And you notice they both get the same reward. Even though one had produced five more talents and one had produced two more talents. So the reward isn't based on the results that they produced. They both receive the reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Enter into your master's paradise. Or peace. I, I forget the specific word used. Enter into heaven is the point. And then, while he's watching this, the, the, the servant who had received the one talent is saying, look, okay, they've, they, got, they got this reward. They're doing good. But I didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't produce anything. I'm, I'm only bringing back what I was given. So, he kind of comes up with this, this confrontation. Like, well, if, if I'm... If I'm firm and I confront the master and I, and, I, and I say, look, I know this is how you are and I didn't want to lose your money, so this is what I did instead. So he goes to the master and he says, I knew that you were a hard man. I knew that you reap where you hadn't sown. I know that you gather where you hadn't put seed. I knew that you were a hard man. And so I just went and I buried your money and here's what's yours. Now maybe I'm weird. Maybe I, uh, I'm a little bit sensitive to political and economic ideas, but this rings in my head kind of like some of our modern day politicians talking about the fat cat bankers who get rich off the backs of the poor and all of this. And I'm not minimizing at all some of the abuses that happen in unregulated uh, situations, but I think that's kind of the attitude that this servant had when he went to the master. I knew you were a hard man. I knew. And then the master responds to him, and he says, yeah, you knew I was a hard man. You knew I, I reap where I hadn't sown, and I gather where I hadn't put seed. He's not agreeing with him. He's using his words against him. You ought to have invested. You ought to have been faithful. If, if you were right, then you ought to have invested even more so than if you were wrong. The, the way that you're characterizing me makes your error even bigger than if you understood me to be who I am, to be a reasonable person. The servant's failure was greater by not investing than by investing and losing the money. So the laziness that he had shown while the master was away was rooted in this misperception of the master as a hard man. If you have a misunderstanding of the master, if you have a misunderstanding of God, that leads to a certain type of conduct that then, if you read to the end of the story, where does the servant end up? In the outer darkness, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. The point is, he's gone to hell. You, re you read on in the consequences, and it, the master says, to him who has will be given more, and he'll have an abundance. And to him who lacks, what he has will be taken, and he'll have nothing. This isn't talking about the material stuff. Remember, the, the money is just the first layer. It's, it's the illustration in the parable. This is talking about their eternal well-being. To him who has will be given more. To Christians who have Christ, they will receive heaven, and to unbelievers who do not have Christ, whatever comfort they have is going to go away because they're going to hell. 
a bad theology, a bad understanding of God, a misperception of the master leads to a certain type of conduct. It would be very easy in this story to say, well, the servant was, was judged the way that he was because he was lazy. No, he wasn't. He was judged in the way that he was because of his misperception of the master. So if you rightly perceive the master, it leads to a different type of behavior. And that different type of behavior is kind of the rest of where I'm going with this. Be faithful to God's call. Be industrious with the resources that he has given you to fulfill his call. Be faithful with God's resources. All of that kind of wrapped up into one thing is, a, is the, the big idea of stewardship. And we very often in the church, we talk about being good stewards with our money. I don't think that the idea of being stewards with our time and with our skills and with our spiritual gifts enters the conversation as often. And I think that is quite tragic because I think it's imperative that whatever skills we have, we use to benefit the kingdom. We use to answer God's call. So that it kind of begs a couple of questions. What specifically is God's call and what specifically are the gifts that he has given us? What, what are these resources that we have that we're supposed to be faithful servants with. So first, I'll answer what is God's call? What is God's call to action, the instruction that we are to carry out? For that, we can look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. This is after Jesus had died and resurrected and done some ministry for a little while. It was right before he ascended into heaven. And this, these are his parting words to the disciples. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. If you've ever heard somebody say that, well, Jesus never said he was God. Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, here is one spot that you can take them and say, yeah, he did. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is saying right here, I'm God. Go, therefore, because I'm God, I'm going to tell you to do something. And it really is in your best interest to do it. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. There's three verbs there. Go, make disciples. Baptize those disciples and then teach those baptized disciples. So the audience narrows a little bit. Go to all of the nations, that's everybody. Make disciples. There's the people who are interested in the church kind of wondering, what's this whole thing about? Baptize those disciples. Those who have come to the church and said, yes, I'm buying in. I believe this. I want Jesus to be my savior. Teach them all that I have taught you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. So now comes, now comes the personal part for me. I am absolutely terrified of using the skills that God has given me. I am terrified of public speaking of any kind. This is a big audience for me. This is like, I'm, this, this is scary. I am terrified of writing down things that I know and, and, and putting them on Facebook even, you know, where it's just this little shallow, hey, I'm doing this today. I'm terrified of writing down in a longer form, putting it online. I'm terrified of sitting in a room with somebody who is hurting, somebody who is suffering, and trying to help them feel better. Because what if I, what if I make it worse? What if I don't know what to say because they're just going through something so tragic and so hard? I'm terrified of failure. I'm terrified of of taking risk. But what was the servant's t terror that caused him not to use what he'd been given? I knew that you were a hard man, master. I was afraid, so I went and I hid your money, and I hid your resources in the ground. So here's what's yours. Those are the things that God has given me that, that I'm, I'm good at. 
And if I don't use them, then I am no better than that lazy and slothful servant. And if I do, then I hope and pray that when I get to Judgment Day, I will hear the reward. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little. I'll put you in charge of much. Go and enter your master's peace. If you are a Christian, God has given you some sort of talent, some sort of spiritual gift, some sort of innate skill that is unique to you, that is for the benefit of the church, and it's for the benefit of your neighbor. I'm not very particular. I don't care if you want to call it a talent, uh, a spiritual gift, or just something you're good at. I think, those, I think if we get uh, too bogged down in the distinctions between those words, then we start acting as if spiritual gifts are only for the church, and we'll never use them when we're in our workplace, or at school, or talking to our neighbor. But that's garbage, because if you have a spiritual gift, if you have a talent that God has given you, it is for use all of the time. Remember, the talent was enough money to retire on in that top layer of that parable. If God has given you a skill, then you have enough of that skill to do whatever task God has called you to do. That doesn't mean go off and be crazy, because the Bible also says to count the cost. But what you have counted the cost and made the endeavor that God has called you to, plan on God making up the difference. So what are just some of the spiritual gifts? You know, what, what are some, some basic ideas? If you have ever studied this before, you'll be familiar with the Bible a little bit already, and you'll know that there are several different lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible. They, they're all different. They all include kind of different sets of spiritual gifts. Some lists leave out what other lists include. I don't think that any of them are comprehensive. So I've picked just one list to look at very briefly today because I think, one, it, it ties in to the parable that we're looking at, and two, it's got a catch-all. So if we miss something, you're, you're included in a catch-all. So this is Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. That sounds familiar. You remember the master gave the number of talents to each servant according to his ability. I think, if we're not careful, we, we could think that they already had the ability to manage that money. I think the master gave those talents knowing that if they relied on him, as we rely on the Holy Spirit, that they would manage it appropriately. I think if there was a, uh, a prologue or a kind of a what happened before our story, our parable picked up, the guy who was the lazy servant and afraid of losing his master's money might have been the one who had been the greatest investor, but he'd also lost it all. And so he was fearful of that experience repeating again. If you read through the Bible and you pay attention to the people that God picks to do great things, he doesn't pick the people that we would. The disciples that he picked were all a bunch of blue-collar, uneducated, cussing sailors and fishermen. The educated people that he did pick were tax collectors. So in that day and in that culture, they were the shadiest of the shady lawyers and, and accountants. And you see, one of them remained shady. He eventually betrayed Jesus. The other gave us the Gospel of Matthew. God doesn't pick people to do great things that in human eyes are qualified to do great things. He's given us a lot of grace. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And then we have just kind of this, um, well, if your gift is prophecy, then in proportion to your faith. If service, then in serving. To the one who teaches, in his teaching. To the one who exhorts, in his exhortation. To the one who contributes, in his generosity. To the one who leads, with zeal. And to the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. So we can look at each of those and, and explain kind of what each of those meant 
to Paul's audience when he wrote this letter. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Prophecy in the Old Testament was a combination of calling out sin, saying God's not going to appreciate what you're doing, Israel, or approaching kings or people of authority and saying, God does not appreciate what you're doing, calling out sin. The other, the other element of Old Testament prophecy was predicting the future, making predictions about the Messiah. We have some prophecy in the New Testament about when Jesus returns. We've been looking at the whole book of Revelation, and that's the whole thing. What's it going to be like when Jesus returns? But the canon is closed, meaning that the Bible we have is it. There's not going to be any more books. So this, this is my opinion. This is debated within Christianity. I'm not going to take it personally if you disagree with me. But my opinion is that prophecy no longer predicts the future. It, it, its main function is to call out sin in a gentle, discerning, and careful way. So he says, prophecy in proportion to faith. I think faith here has two meanings. One is a corporate sense of the faith of the church. Don't overstep scripture. If, if you are somebody gifted with the gift of prophecy, do not overstep scripture. And the second piece, I think it has a personal meaning. Do not overstep your own personal maturity in the faith. If you are approaching somebody who is more mature in the faith, be very careful, be very discerning, and very prayerful in your approach. Prophets today do not add to Revelation. They do not add to Scripture. And I, again, this is my opinion. They don't predict the future. If service, then in service. I think this is kind of the generic catch-all. Even with a church where there's a lot of people who are good at a very narrow set of tasks, they're not often great at it without God's help. And so there's always going to be somebody necessary with just kind of the general jack-of-all-trades fill in the gaps. So if you're somebody who says, oh, I don't... I don't I don't know what I'm good at. I don't know what God's gifted me to do. This might be you. You're, you're, you're a catch-all. You're the backstop. And that's not at all an inferior place to be. I think that's an incredibly valuable place to be. There's teaching, both in a corporate setting like this or in a more personal setting, like a small group, Bible study, or in mentorship. There's exhortation which has both a, a positive and a negative aspect to it. Negative not meaning that it's bad, it's just not fun. On the positive side, exhortation is to encourage and to strengthen and to build up and possibly to counsel somebody. On the negative side, it's a little bit more like a prophet. It, it's rebuke and correction. Calling out sin. Contributions. If you're the person who contributes, then do it in... Do it with great generosity. I think Paul is saying here, look, money is not just money. The way you handle it is a spiritual issue. It costs money to send out missionaries. It costs money to have buildings like this. It costs money to fill food banks. So if you're somebody of means, the way that you handle your money absolutely has spiritual implications. And that may be a spiritual gift. To leaders... Lead with zeal. Sort of a, an idea of passion or tirelessness. Not unaccountability, because again, if you go off in left field, then you're going to run into a prophet or an exhorter, and that encounter is not always fun. But lead with zeal. Lead with passion. And lead with a measure of tirelessness. And if your gift is mercy, do it with cheerf cheerfulness. I don't think that you can help suffering people without cheerfulness because if you try to do it without cheerfulness, you'll burn out. You'll run out of energy. It'll be a drain to you. It won't be something that fills you up and excites you. So to, to bring all those together, our, our parable of the, the talents, the industrious, and the, and the lazy servant, 
I have a couple of quotes from John Calvin. The first one is, we must remember that the talents, and he is talking here in eight skills, with which God has favored us, are not excellencies originating from ourselves, but free gifts of God, of which if any are proud, they betray their ingratitude. So if you're prideful about the things you're good at, you are communicating to the people around you that you are not thankful that God has given you those skills. Another one from John Calvin. Whatever we obtain from the Lord is granted on the condition of our employing it for the common good of the church and therefore the legitimate use of all of our gifts is a kind of liberal communication. He's using older language than what we're used to. Liberal sharing of them with others. There cannot be a surer rule nor a stronger exhortation to the observance of it than when we are taught that all of the endowments that we possess are divine deposits entrusted to us for the very purpose of being distributed for the good of our neighbor. Meaning whatever resources you have, money, time, or talents, whatever God has given you, it is explicitly for the good of the church and the good of your neighbor. So the imperatives, the calls to action in all of this are be humble, not prideful, be generous, not selfish, be faithful and industrious, not shy. And if you're doing those things, you will make disciples. You will bring them to a place where they, they will eventually be baptized. And you will be a part of teaching them the things that God has taught to you. And the scary parts. If we find ourselves being lazy, if we find ourselves being selfish or prideful with the resources that God has given us, then we are the lazy servant. We have misunderstood God's character. We have misunderstood the master. And because of that misunderstanding, we have failed to act. And that leaves us in a very precarious place. If you're here and you find yourself wondering, am I the lazy servant? The answer is very simple. Turn to God in recognition of your sin and your need for him. Pray for the Holy Spirit to fill you. And then wherever you go after this, you'll be working relentlessly, you'll be working tirelessly to build God's kingdom. To reflect God's grace and God's love to others and to bring them into the Christian community. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word and for the, the story and the parable you've given us to examine today. I pray that as we go out here, <coughs> as we go out from here today, that this message will sit in our minds and sit in our hearts in such a way that it might motivate us to act, might motivate us to turn to you and to rely on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Sam.